went as I guess. That's all because I had done it with me, sculpture of salt. Her front bursts with juices and flavor. I snake lower, charmed by her feminine aroma. Lips burnt kisses on petals. Beautiful and black on petals. Pink on the inside. Her mouth owns, I inhale. The warm and cold contrast on her, on her clit makes her body jump and shiver. As my tongue tests, I flick and suckle, I pause and she spasms, breath coming in short gasps. She yields to my gentle thrusts, grinds on my probing tongue, and moans to its swell. I trace the beginnings and ends of her split, and right at the end, I find her destiny. The queen is a rebel, a confident brat, confi sorry, a confident brat. Reeking of self-knowledge, not afraid to be herself. The free will that utter this regard to propriety, perception, complete freedom, and stubbornness. The rejection of correctness. She's a revolution, storming down walls of convention. The rumble of the crumbling barriers thunders in my chest, beckoning, beckoning. I watch her take on the world, but I can only watch. The will, the zeal to be wild, I do not possess. I am powerless. I am an impotent rapist. Revolution beckons, but I cannot riot. I cannot abandon all reason. I am locked in conventional wisdom. So I look to the wild one, the rebel queen, and I recognize myself in her. I recognize myself in her, and I want to be locked. But when I wake up to a world with no goals, the self shrivels, afraid. Why are we afraid of them? The nonconformists, the rebel queens? It's a stupid fear, premised on a misconception that to conform is to be good, is to be cultured, is to be peaceful. So we create peace for those around us and give way to a tumultuous rage within, a rage at consistently confi confining the self cuffing her hands and legs, forbidding her to live. So I watch her, rebel queen, and I recognize myself in her. In rebel queens, myself, experimenting with erotica, I think it's now a year, it's been a year, to seriously experiment, to put work out there. But before that, I was writing, but not sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And how easy was it to write, or how hard was it to write that? Um, the writing was easy. Putting it out was hard. Because yeah. you're, you're scared of judgment, or you're scared of being personally associated with your work. You know, all the weirdness that can come towards a writer who writes erotica. Yeah, but um, yeah, I just put it out there and uh, the reception was good. I used to blog about other things and people never used to read my blog. <laughs> <laughs> then when I post erotica, suddenly I have 60 views, 100 views, and I'm like, oh, so Ugandans love erotica. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I hope everybody can hear me. I don't have a fear because I have felt that we writers, one of our duties is to say the things that people don't want to say. And first of all, I think I have to make a distinction between erotica is written to titillate or to make uh, to to arouse, whereas. Writing about sex in maybe literary fiction like mine, is not, sorry, the intention is not to arouse. The intention is for us to understand each other and to understand human nature and to understand why we do what we do. Or either to develop character so you understand the person better through what they do in town, in the house, in bed. 
but I have realized, I know that uh, one of the reviews, uh, again, that talked about my book, and he said it's just about sex. So obviously, for him, that's all he saw, and didn't see the underlying uh, meaning to, to those scenes in terms of describing a character. And I think when you explore the things that people don't say, you get closer to the truths, because most of the truths about why we do what we do are, are actually hidden, especially in our society as Uganda. We tend to have this hypocritical layer or a facade. And we are never, we have the most churches, but we are also the most corrupt. I guess that's common in many different places. So to get to the root of that, to start to unpack that, is to try to be as honest as possible in fiction. But you sort of can't control your work when it's out there. So whereas your intention is not to excite people, um, some may end up seeing it just like that. So, because that's a fear for many people, that I'm scared of writing sex, because then it will be just about sex, yet I want to say more. How do you overcome that as a writer? How do you get over that? I would say one of the things is, is, first of all, you have to be clear with your intention. You're, you're writing about sex because you want to. What is it there? It has to serve a purpose in the story. And then also, um, avoid cliches. Because when you use the usual cliches of, of heaving and thrusting and whatever, then it sounds more like porn. And then that's when it could be misconstrued. But the awareness that something always has some other meaning once it goes out there, I think is okay because the majority of people, I think, understand. I have been, just because Tropical Fish, the title story, has been performed about seven times in the last year, I'm very much aware of some of the scenes. And the description, for example, in that story is very clinical. It wouldn't arouse anybody. Somebody takes off their clothes, they lie on the bed, someone puts something into somebody else. And it's it's not, uh, unless you have really weird tastes, that would be cut you off. <laughs> because it's very straightforward. And I wanted it to show that this woman is having almost an out of body experience as she's seeing what is being done to her. It's almost like she's written out of her body, she's up there and she's watching her body down there with somebody and she's just observing. You know? So, so in, for, in that sense it is clear. Yeah, so really, I think sex scenes are not really about what actually goes on. It's more about the two people and their relationship. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. There's a blogger, a Ugandan blogger, who does everything as well, and she said that one time she was in a public space and someone dropped her because of what she writes. And he said that you're asking for it because you write about this stuff all the time. Have you had any challenges outside of your writing that have manifested in your physical work? Oh, you're asking here. Yes. <laughs> uh, thankfully, I'm a, I'm a bit of a result person, yeah. so I, I don't socialize a lot. So I, I've not had any weird, any weird um, confrontation with a reader. Uh, though, of course, sometimes you get messages but you have to tell the person off from the white book. Can I have coffee? Why do, you want, why, why do you want to have coffee with me? Here's my email address. We need to discuss anything. Let's discuss. So I think it's just setting boundaries and also letting the readers know that you are distinct from the work. I may write erotica, but it doesn't mean that I'm just going to sleep around with anyone who comes to me. My characters may be sleeping around with anyone, but I am not my characters. So just creating that, you know, putting yourself out there as an erotic writer, not as a prost uh, prostitution is okay, not as a, as a word, an object to be used. Yeah. I think that was just a silly excuse. Yeah. He himself was a groper and he wanted to grow, yes. and he just used that. I'm sure he has an excuse for every single person that he grows. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Do you have any questions? We can't hear. So, um, like you said, I'm a lawyer, and um, during 
my legal studies, I encountered gender and the law. And um, well, gender and the law is basically studying sex, human sexuality, what Stella Nyanzi does, what Sylvia Tamale does. And I was deeply drawn to the topic of sex because I think that sex is um, it's a fundamental aspect of our lives. We exist because of sex. Until recently, when we have you know scientific you know possibilities of giving birth, but before it was sex. So for me, I feel that sex is something that needs to be talked about. The way we talk about food, the way we talk about clothes, and um, if you're going to be playful about it, it's okay. If you're going to write about it in terms of the way um, Sylvia Tamale does it, non-academic uh, structure, it's okay. If you're going to write about it in poetry. So, okay, so it was my way of contributing to the theme of sexuality, but using my art. Yeah. So like the poem I performed, it's about uh, female to female sexual intercourse. So I'm confronting you with the fact, with the pleasure that they have when they do what they do. And I'm asking you, why are you afraid of them? Why? Why? They have the confidence to be who they are. So why can't you look at that and take that, take that beauty, the fact that someone is confident enough to be who they are, and you know, ignore the fact that for you it's weird or it's different or immoral according to you. Yeah. Uh, are you taken seriously as an erotica writer? Um, not yet, and because uh, I'm not published, I don't have any publication yet. So I, I basically use my blog and my poetry performances when I perform. Do you have people that criticize you for what you write? <laughs> well, honestly, I don't care. I don't really care. And uh, before I got into this, I I had a talk with myself. I had uh, <laughs> I studied. I I did I did a bit of revision and got the distinction between pornography and erotica because the two are very distinct uh, pornography is I mean it's pornography, it's just sex sex, 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 I mean we just put sex out there, erotica is different, you, you, you have purpose in why you're writing, so my poem it has a purpose, if I'm writing about female masturbation, I have a purpose why I'm writing that, because maybe it's frowned upon, maybe no one talks about it, maybe no one knows that it's possible, so it's I guess it's, um, I don't care about the critics. The critics I care about, but the ones who criticize me for what I write, just on the basis of your right sex or your immoral, your, I don't care about them. <laughs> I don't think you can go out and be a writer while caring too much about what people think. It's sort of a combination of two. In a sense, you choose this career because you do like the public life and the public attention. But at the same time, you build a wall within yourself where you have to not care. It seems like a paradox. But you can't please everybody. Even if you were to write a, a Christian pam pamphlet, you would still be criticized. Yes. There's always going to be someone somewhere unhappy with what you're doing. So don't take that as part of your consideration unless you can tell that this is a serious critic making some serious points about, first of all, that they understand what you're doing and then they're criticizing it from a point of view of having understood. So, and precisely the work as a person. Exactly, as the person. As the person. Yes. Yeah. Um, since, you, since you said something about not caring, um, would you, in future, bring to us a character who is gay, being the main character on this continent? Both of you, would you do this? Because right now, like a female writer in, on the African continent, wherever you go, somebody writes about a female to female. Most people wouldn't even consider it homosexuality. They're like, oh, ah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you go to countries where they take people to prison for being homosexual, the women are so not in those books. So yeah, would you consider bringing a man out there as a main character? And this question goes to both of you. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's something that, when I pick a topic to write about, it's something that moves me. And it doesn't necessarily come from the outside in, but this is a hot topic, or the people who have been marginalized, I should write about it. 
But if that character speaks to me, and there's a story there about that person's humanity, not just about that person's homosexuality. I don't know if you can see the difference there. Because we are not these labels. People put on these labels so that they can um, so that they can have the prejudices that they have. Behind that mask is a human being. So I really liked uh, the panel yesterday where somebody talked about he got and talked about how he has this character who is a transgender, and it's because as a writer he knows that we all have to inhabit the other sex if we are going to write that sort of character. And I see it that way. It's really an understanding of another person's experience, but I have to be drawn to it. So I would want to give that character speech. Yes, I would. I would consider it. Uh, but um, maybe to add on to what Doreen says, um, and what you also point out, male, 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 male sexual relationships currently in Uganda are not very, you know, it's not a very safe thing to write about. And uh, when I say self, I don't mean that someone is going to come and probably arrest you or, but even me as a person, I have not, I have not experienced authentic uh, gay relationships. So within my circles, for instance, within the people I meet within, so it's, it still feels a bit distant and I'm not denying because I, I have no problem with that, with homosexuality. But it's just that it's, it's still very distant for me to, to tap into as a, as, a, as a writer, as an artist. Because like Doreen says, you kind of have to be consumed by it when you're writing. You don't have to do the act itself, but you, know, you have to have a certain understanding. I don't want to write stereotypical stuff about you know, gay people. I want to have an understanding of you know, a gay relationship. And so my creativity is, is driven by something authentic but it's still very distant for me. But I would consider it. Have you had some moments when they may be transgender or maybe as a priest's and Excuse me, and I can't be responsible at this point of this. This is a moral story, then, because I can't be responsible to that. I haven't had the experience. Most people don't read. I think they don't, it's a fact. I don't, I don't even think, I, you know, I don't go to church on them. I go like once in a very, very blue moon. And um, uh, I haven't had that problem just because I don't think many other people go to church. I'm not being snobbish, but I'm just saying they don't read literary fiction. Maybe if I was writing a column in a newspaper or if maybe you had invited Stella Nyanzi here, maybe you should have more to say about the, the public uh, face of that. But I would repeat that you cannot let that stop you because there are a lot of people out there who... If I use this word, you're going to get another. They are kind of ignorant. Sorry for using that word. I'm not looking down on them or whatever, but they have, okay, sorry, I'll cancel that word. They have a different way of looking at life than I. Their view is legitimate. Sometimes, sometimes it's full of prejudice. Sometimes it is uninformed. I have my own view. I do not have to bow down to their view. Otherwise, you know, the world is all about a diversity of ideas and art is all about breaking boundaries. If you want to do something creative and something new, you cannot afford to stay safe. Um, I've also, I've not had that experience. Um, I guess maybe I don't, like her, I don't, I go to church, but not so much. And I don't take my erotica to church. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take it to young kids. I don't. Uh, so my assumption is, when you come to my blog and you read my erotica, you have chosen to read it. I have not shoved it down your throat, down your ears. So if you feel that it is immoral, please don't read it. Yeah. Uh, I I think what. I'm a believer in spirituality, yeah, so I believe in the wind, I believe in God, I believe in, if you tell me Buddhism is good, I'll try it, so for me, religion, is a, it's, it's like food, you want to try some kachumbali, you want to try some mint, you want to try some bees, yeah, so my, I'm from a Christian family, it doesn't, I don't feel bound by the Christianity virtues, so I can go across 
It is not it, it is not a Christian to talk about sex. God created sex. Right? What happens with religion is that a lot of it are cultural values that have been put on top of a set of spiritual beliefs. So as we all know, uh, our great great grandparents were walking around uh, quite freely in skimpy outfits. When the missionaries came and they said this is wrong because they were Victorian and their culture was being dressed from top to toe. So that doesn't mean that how we were dressed was wrong. So it's just a lot of it is cultural baggage that we have to separate. Exactly. So it's up to you to speak for yourself what 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 you're going to live by. The writing process. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's uh, poetic word is someone else's vulgarity. So you can't really go by, uh, w words in themselves have no uh, innocent. It's up to us and what we put, the meaning we put onto them. And over time they change. You know, the word gay used to mean happy, now it means something else. So my process would be, what does that character call it? That character must have a reason for what? So if you're trying to make a point that this character has been bowed down by heavy religious baggage that he can't even say the name, he'll just say, I brought it out and it looked so big. And that shows you that this character cannot face themselves and cannot even give a name to it. If you use a local word, then maybe you're showing this person is of a certain, is it in a certain neighborhood who says, and they use this kind of word. So everything, a lot of it has to do with character building. But I brought a scene written by somebody else that I read recently that I wanted to read. I happened to be reading when I was invited to this panel, a short story writer by an American called Elizabeth Strout. So not necessarily an African writer, but I just love how, uh, how it's a sort of a love triangle in a sense, but it's all in his head. So it's a married man having sex with his wife, but he's thinking about this woman who he loves, who is actually married to someone else. So it's quite complicated. So this is what I say. He loved her guileness. He loved the purity of her dreams. But this did not mean, of course, that he was in love with her. The natural reticence of her, in fact, caused him to desire Olive, his wife, with a new wave of power. Olive's sharp opinions, sudden deep laughter, unfolded within him a new level of aching eroticism. And sometimes, when he was heaving in the dark of night, it was not Denise, the girl he loved, who came to mind, but oddly, her strong young husband. The fierceness of the young man as he gave way to the animalism of possession, and there would be, for Henry Kittredge, a flash of incredible frenzy as the thought, as though in the act of loving his wife, he was joined with all men in loving the world of women who contain the dark, mossy secret of the earth deep within him. Goodness, Olive said when he moved off her. 
<laughs> so he's not really making love to his wife. He's making love with all women. He's with all men, making love with all women <laughs> in that one act. So you can see what literature can do. It's just it's so beyond just two human beings. It can express a whole world of what is going on and the complexity of relationships. You can love three or four people at once. You know? And you can be making love to one person, but you're making love to all the loves you have ever had, perhaps. How do you portray that in words? It's not as simple as just some two people having sex. There's all that's going on in your mind. And to portray that uh, with depth and um, even humor, yeah. yeah. And maybe on that, on that issue of the process. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Darren mentioned something that was uh, that I found interesting when she talked about process when you're choosing the language that you want to use. And it's true that if your character determines what they call it. Yeah. So if your character says fuck a lot, it should be okay for you to say last night we fucked. But then now when someone else is reading it without an understanding of who your character is, they'll say writer is so vulgar but the character is vulgar so you're portraying and, and maybe and the other thing she said was words have changed meaning you listen to Jamaican music and they say the word pussy I don't know how many times and people don't you don't you never see anyone switching off the radio or turning off the TV yeah? yeah yeah so so why should we pretend that I can't stand here and say pussy Oh, I can't write pussy a, a thousand times in my in my novel if I'm hearing it a million times on radio. So I think it's the hypocrisy, that hypocrisy of saying, oh, this is so vulgar, I can't write it, I can't say it. It's okay to write it, but know why you're writing it and why, how you're going to write it. Another thing I also discovered about writing it and, and the whole issue of vulgarity and non-vulgarity is that I think that in our own languages, it's not that people never talked about sex. They used innuendo, they used metaphors, they used many playful things and not in the direct way. So in one of the stories I remember putting, I think it was an HIV AIDS story, where I put um, how at funerals, in fact funerals was a place where many people went into the shambas or whatever and had a lot of sex because they are celebrating death and they are celebrating life. And I had that in a Chiganda song, where, where they were celebrating that, you know, let us have sex because death, yeah, death exists. And then I think when we picked up this whole, you know, with the missionary schooling and, and the whole sort of, um, I wouldn't necessarily say white, but I would say it came at that, with that Victorian baggage, with what was brought to us in our education system where we think, oh, we just don't talk about these things. But it is not true. We used to talk about them, but in a more artistic way. Because the more you try to use the innuendo and metaphors, and in fact, the closer you get, because you're leaving it open to the interpretation of the, of the audience. Does that's, that make sense? That's very interesting, yeah. because when we discussed uh, the sex to me anthology, a lot of it was very direct. And some people read me my imagination and put myself there. Of course it helps, you know, to have had sex. But I haven't had sex in all the different ways I've written about it. <laughs> 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 then you'd be limiting yourself to just your own experience. Yeah, but also we are influenced by all the movies we have watched, all the books we have read, all that. So it doesn't have to be a personal experience. All those things feed your imagination and give you a sense of... of 
Collecting data. Go ahead. Okay, one of my favorite bloggers writes very good sex scenes. And every his story has to have sex, soldiers. That is just him. Who is that? Uh, Chanchori, Charles Chanchori. Uh, he's from Ken. <laughs> Then I one day asked him, why do you like writing about sex? Because after I read, sometimes I feel I should go to the chapel and do some confession. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked him, why do you usually write about sex? He tells me, first, I enjoy. Second, sex sells. So is it true that sex sells? Does sex, writing about sex really sell? Because I, I thought he's using sex to get market for his work. His stories must have a scene of sex. A very long one for that matter. Yes. Oh. Is so, he rich? Um, <coughs> let's say... Yes. Sex sells. Um, I'm not sure about rich. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know how it's... You know, how's the bank account? <laughs> I don't know how she has <laughs> <laughs> Sex sells. Yeah, it does. And uh, if, if we are to go through the statistics of how many people read the red pepper, and uh, you know the red pepper makes so many sales because of sex. Uh, and like I told you, my blog, I, I never used to get readers until I started blogging about sex. But the selling may not necessarily be material, yeah? And uh, I, I wouldn't say that I've written about sex so that I can sell. It's not the only thing I write about. And I think to also write about it in that way is, is a bit, um, I don't know. Okay, it's a choice you can make. You can choose to write, but I, I don't. I wouldn't write sex because it sells. I want to write it because people enjoy it and they want to read it. They can read it. I'm going to pay for it. Well, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, if I may just comment, the time we were discussing the sex, uh, sex theology, we had more people at the book club than we had ever had. <laughs> This audience is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. There's something exciting about also things that are forbidden because a lot of people here yeah, don't get a chance to talk about sex as currently and as um, in the written form as as often as it should be. Yeah, yeah. I think sex is intriguing. I think as a writer, I do literary fiction, so I don't write for the red paper. Maybe the people who want to sell magazines can use it. But it is true that, that uh, naked pictures or half-dressed women sell magazines or, or whatever. So unfortunately, I don't know if that is necessarily sex sales or exploitation of women. It depends on, on how, I guess also half-dressed men sell magazines, but not as much. Um, for literary fiction, you don't, I don't think you go into it necessarily for popularity. If you did, you'd do something else. Yeah. The, the motivation really can't be uh, the number. You want to be well read, but you also want to be held in high esteem. Not high esteem morally, but like good writers can say this is good writing. For me, that's what I'm looking for, where people who can say that she really has an understanding of the human condition and she knows how to, she's trying her best to describe the human condition. <laughs> that is what matters to me. And I don't think that filling a story with sex scenes would necessarily serve that purpose. It's about what is it going to add to the story? To, to what, why am I telling this story? You know? And if a sex scene doesn't help again in revealing character or moving the plot forward or whatever, then I wouldn't indulge in it. And actually, a reader can tell if you're just using it to titillate. Yeah. But sometimes also just to push back on all the moralism and, uh, and the no-go areas and the enforced uh, being proper, that you can sometimes do that just to be naughty. Yeah. When, I, when I write about sex, I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm objectifying the woman. Yeah? Because I'm a woman, so I, I don't feel like I understand. Like I'm writing maybe about pleasure or if it's pain or whatever I'm writing about. But it's not because I'm objectifying 
while you're right for a man, if a man now, like, if we, if we had to look at Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah, if it was a no, man who had written like, it, do you feel your, how come, you never feel like you're objectifying a man, the man? Oh, oh the man himself. Yes, if we had to reverse it, because the men are looked at as objectifying the woman who they're writing, of course, they're writing, usually they're writing about it from their perspective, them having sex with a woman. So if you're writing about you having sex with a man, it's never considered that you are objectifying a man, the man you're writing about. That's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. It depends. It depends. It depends. It depends. It depends. depends on the, the voice that is speaking, yeah, the voice in the story. So if it's the, because you know, we have first person, third person, those are the commonest, yeah? So if I am narrating, if I'm using the voice of the third person, then I might be found guilty of objectifying, depending on how I have written about the experience. But if I'm writing in the, in the, from the point of view, yeah? of the woman and she's only looking at her pleasure and everything else about the man seems like objectification i think that's okay it's not objectification it's because she's she's talking about it from her point of view and i actually don't believe in the whole objectification thing or when we say oh after i slept with him he left me after i gave him this after i did this for her she left me because sex is not something that and sex i don't know it's not an object it's not like something you said have no, it's like it's it's a shared experience. So I don't know. Objectification in sex is a bit hard for me to conceptualize, unless I'm doing it as a third person and I ignore someone else's emotions. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think both men and women are capable of objectifying. But the fact is that we live in a society. I we live in a, in a patriarchal society where men have the power. So for example, most of the movies we see, you're might more likely to see a naked woman than you see a naked man. You know, how many naked men have we seen? Not just their chests, but the actual body parts. Whereas in most of the popular world popular movies, not for kids, women have to bear their, their boobs or, or an asses shown or whatever. And there are so many other ways. It's very much harder for an older actress to get roles, you've got to be young and pretty. So all of us are influenced by this cultural baggage. So even women can objectify women because it's what we've been fed on. I mean, if you look at women's magazines, there are so many pictures of women used to sell products. And in men's magazines, they also use images of women to sell products. But I do think it comes now to the level of skill and the level of sensitivity and honesty in trying to explore those issues. I have read some very good male writers who write about sex and you feel as if they have an understanding of women as if they are women. Now that comes to, to an individual level, who that person is and, and the exploration they've done inside themselves to mature. But um, for example, in Tropical Fish I was very very, uh, uh, what's the word, deliberate in talking about the man's body. How the man, and you know, there's a part where I say he has pale, saggy legs, he turns and shows his bum to the woman, whatever. Because I have rarely seen it in fiction. We see a woman's body being seen, you know, that very famous male case. But you don't see a male being as sexualized. Usually they are there for their brain power, for how they think. It's not about the size of the book. Yeah. So how do we fight that? And I think good literary fiction helps us see the world differently. And it's not an ability that men have or women have. It's an ability for an individual to want to learn beyond what they've been taught, what society has taught, has taught them. So that's my long answer. <laughs> But I have always had a fear, I and mean, of course you can portray a character who is misogynist. In that way, he would objectify women, but you're doing it deliberately because such men exist and you're portraying such a woman, such a man. See what I mean? 
So if you have that intention to portray a character who has his views, then of course you have to present those views. Not as you as the writer, but as the narrator of the story. Yeah, I would say don't wait for permission. Don't wait for permission. You can write whatever you want to write. It comes from inside you. What is your motivation? And why are you doing it? And it's not that you write because now I understand women and I'm an authority of women, therefore I can write. All of us are just exploring and trying our best. But it's also about educating ourselves. Maybe talk to a few women about their point of view and learn more about it. I mean, that is not only, I think, a gender thing. I think even like a racial thing is a whole thing that, oh, we are black people. How can you come and write about us? Do you really know us? That comes from a lot of the stories being written bad. And so there's a whole history of like misrepresentation that people are answering back to and say, do you know enough? Have you done your research? Have you tried to inhabit? Or are you looking at it from a superior point of view? What is your agenda? So they're not saying don't do it. But ask yourself, why are you doing it? Do you know enough? Do you have the sensitivity? It's always good to start with what you know also, I think. I think I have focused a lot on female characters because I'm a woman and it's what I know. But I'd like to venture into the male character because my main source is the imagination. And now that I have a son, I know that men are not so different from women. It's, it's all the structure that we put on us. So he's emotional, you know, he has, he has feelings, he's... Uh, maybe I'm making him up, maybe it's some too feminine. <laughs> But I don't think, sometimes we just separate this gender thing like there are two huge things. Even the racial thing, when it comes to people are human beings. People are human beings. But I see the humanity in that person. If I was that person, how would I do that? That is a gender person. Yeah, um, I think she says it. You just have to get started. If you have that interest, start. But then we you also need to be cautious of the of the thing, the, the prejudice that maybe is going to be, you know, attached to you. They will say maybe, oh, he's a man, so when he writes this, blah, blah, blah. But then if you're cautious about it and you have a reason why you're writing that way, then it's okay. If, if your character is being abused and you're writing about abuse, it's not because you don't respect women, but because you're writing about a woman being abused. So, it's okay. Okay, mine, uh, you addressed it a bit, uh, talking about just write what you want to write, forget about everybody else. But we come from a society where our families have a huge influence in our lives. They direct your career direction, where you're living, which man you're going to marry, like family has a huge way. In order. my question, especially to you, um, has your mom, for example, read your work? And how are you, for example, my mom is a bit more conservative, so even the stuff I write, I can't show her. Yet, I will not go so, so sexual directly. I will use so many metaphors, I'll try to hide it because I'm also conscious of myself. So, even this censored version, I'm like afraid to share it with my family. So, how do you, like, have you dealt with that? <laughs> That's interesting. Ah, let me see. My family. I don't know if my parents have read my work. They have. They have not converted me. I did see that. But I've always been vocal about sex, and uh, for me, it's it's, a, it's a, an open topic for discussion. And my family knows me for controversy, so I'm I, I know they would not be surprised to discover that I'm writing that work. But also for the benefit of another writer who may be interested, I think it's important. One of the first, I think the first thing that I did when I decided that I'm going to write and put my work out there is to separate. To, you're an individual. You, as the writer, you're very distinct from the stuff that you write. So even if my parents were to say, oh, this is immoral, I'll tell them, you know me, you have raised me. Do you think that I am that person? 
are you convinced that I am that person? And if I'm that person, it won't, it's not something I can hide, it will come out. So again, just be yourself and then feel free to write whatever you write. Right? When, you're, when, you're, when you make that distinction, then you're able to defend whatever it is you're writing. Because the truth is, you're, you're not what you're writing, but you're writing it. But if, you're, if you are what you're writing, it's still okay. I mean, that's who you are, accept it. And if you're confronted, say so that's who I am. I think sometimes we use family as an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you're so far scared of going there, and you're like, oh, my family, my what, my what. I would say, with all due respect, fuck your family. <laughs> you just have to do what you have to do. If you really are a writer, conventionality is not morality. So if you just want to be conventional, you will not bring out anything new. If you keep listening to the voices that uh, that scare you, you will not do the thing that you're supposed to do in life. I confess with all my bravado now, I wrote the book when I was out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a little bit easier to not hear the society's uh, voices and blah, 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 blah. So I was in a more liberal space and it helped free me. But then I came back and I really think that that is exactly the hypocrisy that is a problem in this country. It is that kind of hypocrisy that Stella Nyanzi can say what she says and everybody's so worried about how she says it and not the points. I'm sorry, I have to go political. Like she says, the things she's talking about are more vulgar than the words she's using. You know, the murders and the, and the, and the, the bad education system, the bad health system, all that is actually more vulgar than the language because her language has not killed anyone. But as long as we want to hide behind propriety, we will never say the truth. So you have to dare yourself to go there. You have to dare yourself not to be liked. Pornography is mechanical, yeah? It's, uh, it's just, you know, people maybe just making love. No one cares how they feel. No one cares whether they are actually expressing what they feel. So I try to make sure that my 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 poetry, because I've I've mostly experimented in poetry, is uh you know it's it's beyond the act. It should be beyond the act. Of course, you're you're basically describing one thing, which is having sex. A man putting maybe his dick in a vagina or two vaginas rubbing or two dicks, or whatever it is. But how are you describing it? Is the person reading able to feel what these people probably felt? That's what I'm going for. I don't know if I achieve it, but at least that's what I, I try to go for. And I think that's what this, well, that's the distinction between erotica and pornography. The purpose for which it's written. For pornography, it's dark. Let's go straight to the point. Sex, are you turned on? Cool, it's done. Erotica is different. You kind of want to take care of the, the sensibilities of the people you're writing about. Yeah, you, you're, you're cautious of what they feel, what they do, why they're doing it. So it's that, that difference. Right? And I think literary fiction is a very good place to explore sex that is not good. Because the purpose in sex and literary fiction is not necessarily to titillate or to show that sex is perfect, but they are showing human beings and human relations. Mm -hmm. So for example, the excerpt I read, the woman is in a totally different space. And the man is in a different space, but they are together physically. And so the woman, the all she can say is goodness. Because she's like, oh, what's come over him? And this is a marriage, so I can imagine you've done it time and time again. I don't know, I've never been married. But I'm sure it gets boring. But my point is, <laughs> that's the space for literary fiction, where you can talk about that boredom. It's not about glorifying sex, it's about just showing the human that they are. And that's the difference with the things that we are Yeah. Because there was never a bad sex scene. Yeah. They don't even finish. <laughs> They're just heaving bottles. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> you never know exactly what's happening. Yeah, so that's the difference between yeah. 